Heart of the World by H. Ryder Haggard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 14 the city of the heart while it was yet dark on the following morning we were awakened by the voice of zibalbe calling us arise he said it is time to start upon our road are the litters here i asked no nor can be for some hours i desire to reach the city this night therefore we must push forward on foot to meet them then we rose, and having no choice, dressed ourselves as best we could in the garments of the country that had been given to us, for our own were but rags in which we were ashamed to be seen. In the common room we found Zibalbe and the Lady Maya. Eat, said the old man, pointing to food that was ready, and let us be going. Ten minutes later we were outside the house. There was no wind but at this great height the air is of so piercing a quality that we were glad to hold our serapes round us and walk briskly forward, Zibalbe leading the way. At first a grey gloom reigned, but presently snowy peaks shone through it, everywhere radiant with the hues of the unrisen sun, although the mountain sides beneath us were still wrapped in night by degrees as the light grew we saw that the country at our feet was shaped like a bowl whereof the mountain range upon which we stood formed the rim and at the bottom of the bowl fed by numberless streams that had their sources among the surrounding snows lay the lake the holy waters of this people of all this however we could as yet see little since the vast expanse beneath us lay hidden in volumes of mist that moved and rolled like the face of ocean never before had we looked upon anything so strange as this dense garment of vapour while the light of heaven gathered upon its surface tinging it with lines and patches of colour it seemed as though a map of the world was unrolled before us. Continents, seas, islands, and cities formed themselves only to disappear in quick succession and assume new and endless shapes. "'It is beautiful, is it not?' said Maya. "'But wait until the mist breaks. Look, it is beginning.' As she spoke, of a sudden, the sea of mist grew thin and opened in its center, and through the gap thus formed showed first the pyramids and temple-tops, and then the entire panorama of the city, heart of the world floating, as it were, upon the face of the holy waters. It was far away, but now that the night fog no longer thickened the air, so clear was the atmosphere, and so high were we above it, that it seemed to be almost at our feet. The city, which appeared to be surrounded by a wall, was built of marble, or some other snow-white stone, whereon the light gleamed and flashed. It stood upon a heart-shaped island, and round about the shores of this island, stretching further than the eye could reach, sparkled the blue waters of the holy lake by degrees the ring of mist rolled up the sides of the mountains and vanished and in place of it the round bowl of the valley was filled with the clear light of day now we could see the shores of the lake with their green fringe of reeds and above them grasslands threaded by silver streams, and above these again upon the flanks of the mountains, great forests of oak and cedars rising almost to the snow line. To the right and left of us the huge round-shouldered mountains stretched in a majestic sweep till they melted into the blue of the horizon, while here and there some tall, snow-robed peak the cone of an extinct volcano towered above us like a sentinel 
"'There lies my country,' said Maya, with a proud wave of her hand. "'Does it please you, white man?' "'It pleases me well, Maya,' he answered. "'That now, less than ever, can I understand why you wish to leave it. "'Because, though lakes and mountains and cities full of wealth are fine things, "'it is not to these, but to the men and women among whom we live, that we must look for happiness. Some people might think otherwise, Maya. They might say that happiness must be sought for in ourselves. At least I could be happy in such a land as this. Oh, you think so now, she answered meaningly. But when you have been a while in the city yonder, you will think otherwise. Oh, she went on passionately, if indeed you care for me, we should never have crossed that mountain behind us. But you do not care for me, not truly, for all this time you have been half ashamed of your affection for an Indian girl whom you were obliged to become fond of, because she was pretty and you were so much with her, and she chanced to save your life. Yes, you would have been ashamed to marry me according to your customs, and to show me as your wife among the white people, me, the wandering Indian with a mad father whom you found in the land hands of thieves. Here it will be different, for here at least I am a great lady, and you will see the people in the streets bow themselves to the ground before me. And if I say that a man shall die, you will see that man killed. Also here I have wealth more than any white woman, and you will be fond of me for that. You are very unjust, he broke in angrily. It is shameful that you should speak to me thus for no cause. Perhaps I am unjust, she answered with a sob, but... There are so many troubles before us. First there is Tikal. What does Tikal want? answered the Senor. He wants to marry me or become Kachike of the city in my right, which is the same thing. At least he will not give me up without a struggle. Then there is my father, who serves two masters only, his gods and his country, and who will use me like a piece in a game, if it suits his purpose. Yes, and you too. Our good days are done with. The evil ones have to come, and after them the night. Henceforward we shall find few opportunities of speaking even, for I shall be surrounded by officers and waiting ladies who will watch my every action and hear my every word, and my father will watch me also. Now I begin to be sorry that I did not take your advice and stop on the further side of the mountain, answered the Senor. Do you think that we could escape there? No. It is too late. They would track us down. We must go on now and meet our fate, whatever it may be. Only swear to me by my gods or your own, or whatever you hold dear, that you will cleave to me till I am dead, as I will cleave to you. And taking his hand in hers, she looked up appealingly into his face. At this moment, Zibalbe, who was walking in front, lost in his own thoughts, chanced to turn and see them. "'Come hither, daughter, and you, white man,' he said in a stern voice. "'Listen, both of you. I am old, but my sight and hearing are still keen, though yonder in the wilderness I took no heed of much that I saw and heard.' Here in my own land it is otherwise. Learn, white man, that the lady of the heart is set far above you, and there, I think, she will remain. Do you understand my meaning? Perfectly, answered the Senor, striving to control his anger. But, chief, it is a pity you did not see well and tell me this before. 
had it not been for what we and one dead were able to do to save you today your bones would have been whitening in the forest why did you not tell me there that i was no fit company for your daughter because you were sent by the gods to do me service and because there i had need of you white man answered zibalbe quietly as maybe i shall have need of you again had it not been for that chance we should have parted company on the farther side of the mountain in truth i wish that we had exclaimed the senor i may come to wish it too said the old man grimly but you are here and not there perhaps for so long as you shall live and i would have you remember that you are in my power a word from me will set you high or lay you low beneath the earth therefore be warned and take with gratitude that which it shall please me to give you no do not look behind you escape is impossible submit yourself to my will in this and everything and all shall be well with you struggle against it and i will crush you i have spoken be pleased to walk in front of me and do you daughter walk behind now i saw that the senor's rage was great and that he was about to answer angrily and lifted my hand in warning while maya looked at him entreatingly he saw and checked himself i hear your words chief he said in a forced voice you are right i am in your power and it is useless for me to answer you and he took his place in front as he had been commanded while maya fell behind as i walked on side by side with zibalbe i spoke to him saying you use sharp words toward him who is my brother chief and therefore towards me i speak as i must he answered coldly many troubles await me at the city did you not hear what that knave said last night that tikal my nephew whom i left in charge rules in my stead well this girl of mine who is a fiance to him and through whom he hopes to govern in after years may be the only bait that will tempt him from his place for he looks upon me as one dead and it will not please him to lay down the rod of power how should it please him then and those who follow him to see a white stranger holding that daughter's hand and whispering in her ear ignacio i tell you that such a sight would provoke a war against me therefore it is that i spoke sharply while well, there is yet time and therefore you will do well to drive the nail home seeing that if i fall your plans will come to nothing and your life be forfeit i made no answer for at that moment we turned a corner and came face to face with the bearers of the litters whom sibalbe had summoned to meet us there were forty of these men or more for the most part they were tall and well-shaped, with regular features and, like Zibalbe and Maya, very fair for Indians, but the look upon their faces was different from any that I have seen among my people. It was not stupid or brutal or even empty. Rather did it suggest great weariness. The youngest man there, notwithstanding his rounded cheeks and eyes full of health, seemed as though he were weighed down by the memories of many years weariness was the master not of their bodies for they were very strong and active but of their minds and looking at them i could understand what zibalbe meant when he said 
that his race was outworn. Even the sight of the white face of the Senor, strange as it must have been to them, did not seem to move them. They stared indeed, muttering something to each other as to the length and color of his beard, and that was all. But Zibalbay, they said in low guttural tones, Father, we salute you. Then at a signal given by their captain, they cast themselves upon the ground before him, and lay there with outstretched arms as though they were dead. "'Rise, my children,' said Zibalbe, summoning the captain of the bearers. He talked to him while his companions ate food that they had brought with them, and I noted that what he heard seemed to give him little pleasure. Next he ordered us to enter the litters, which were of rude make, being constructed of chairs without curtains, lashed between two poles, and carried each of them by eight bearers, for the road was very steep and rough. We started forward down the mountain, and in an hour we had left the region of snow behind and entered the cedar forests. These great trees grew in groups, which were separated by glades of turf, the home of herds of deer. So thick was their foliage that a twilight reigned beneath them, while from each branch hung a fringe of grey Spanish moss that swayed to and fro in the draught of the mountain's breeze. Everywhere stretched vistas that brought to my mind memories of the dimly lighted nave of the great cathedral at Mexico, roofed by the impenetrable boughs of these cedars, whereof the trunks might have been supporting columns, and the scent their leaves, the odor of incense. After the cedar belt came the oak groves, and then miles of beautiful turf slopes, clothed in rich grass starred with flowers. Truly it was a lovely land." It was late in the afternoon before we descended the last of these slopes and entered the tract of alluvial soil that lay between them and the lake, where the climate was much warmer. It was easy to see by the irrigation ditches and other signs that this belt of country had always supplied the inhabitants of the city of the heart with corn and all necessary crops. Here grew great groves of sugar cane and cocoa bushes laden with their purple pods, together with many varieties of fruit trees planted in separate orchards. Soon it became clear to us that the greater part of these ancient orchards were untended since their fruit rotted in heaps upon the ground. Evidently they had been planted in more prosperous days, and now their supply exceeded the wants of the population. At length, as the evening began to fall, we entered the village of corn growers, a half-ruined place of which the houses were for the most part built of adobe or mud bricks, and roofed with a concrete of white lime. In the center of the village was a plaza planted round with trees, and having in its midst a fountain near to which stood a simple altar piled with fruit and flowers. Close to this altar the inhabitants of the village, to the number of a hundred or so, were gathered to meet us. Most of the men had but just come in from their labors, for their garments and feet were stained with fresh earth, and they held copper hoes and reaping hooks in their hands. All of these wore upon their faces the same look of weariness of mind which we had noticed in the bearers. So monotonous were their countenances, indeed, that I turned my eyes impatiently to the group of women who were standing behind them. Like their husbands and brothers, these women were very fair for Indians and handsome in person, but they also had been stamped with melancholy. The sight of the Senor's white skin and chestnut-colored beard seemed for some few moments to rouse them from their attitude of listless indifference. 
Soon, however, they fell into it again and began to chat idly or to play with and pull to pieces the flowers that every one of them wore at their girdle. There were hardly any children among the crowd, and it was strange to observe how great was the resemblance of the individuals composing it to each other. Indeed, had they all been members of a single family, it could not have been more marked, seeing that it was difficult for a stranger to distinguish one woman from another of about the same age. When Zabalbe descended from his litter, all those presents prostrated themselves and remained thus till, followed by some of the headmen, he had passed into a house which was made ready for his use, leaving us without. "'Do all your people look so sad?' I asked the Lady Maya. "'Yes,' she answered. "'That is, all the common people who labor. "'It is otherwise with the nobles who are of a different blood. "'Here, Don Ignacio, there are two classes, "'the lords and the people, "'and of the people each family is forced to work for three months in the year, "'the other nine being given to them for rest.' The fruits of their labor are gathered into storehouses and distributed among all the children of the heart. But the temples, the Kachike, and many of the nobles have their own serfs who have served them from father to son. And what happens if they will not work? asked the Signor. Then they must starve for nothing is served out to them or their families from the common store and when they grow hungry they are set to the heaviest tasks. Now we understood why these people looked so weary and listless. What could be expected from men and women without ambition or responsibility, the gain of whose toil was placed to the public credit and doled out to them in rations? In my old age I have heard that there are teachers who advocate such a system for all mankind. But of this I am sure, that had they dwelt among the people of the heart, where it had been in force for many centuries, they would cease to preach this doctrine, for there at least it did not promote the welfare of the race. Presently a messenger came from Zibalbe to summon us into the house where we found an ample meal prepared, consisting chiefly of fish from the lake, baked wild fowl, and many sorts of fruit. By the time we had finished eating and had drunk the chocolate that was served to us in cups of hammered silver, the night had fallen completely. I asked Sibolbe if we should sleep there, uh, to which he replied shortly that we were about to start for the city. Accordingly, we set out by the light of the moon, and were guided to a little harbor in the shore of the lake, where a large canoe fitted with a mast and sail, and manned by ten Indians, was waiting for us. We embarked, and the wind, being off land, hoisted the sail, and started towards the island of the heart, which stood at a distance of about fifteen miles from the mainland. The breeze was light, but after the cold of the mountains the air was so soft and balmy, and the scene so new and strange that I, for one, did not regret our slow progress. Nobody spoke in the boat, for all of us were lost in our own reflections, and the Indians were awed to silence by the presence of their lord, who alone seemed impatient since from time to time he pulled his beard and muttered to himself. So we glided across the blue lake, whose quiet was broken only by the whistling wings of the wild fowl traveling to their feeding grounds, by the sudden leaps of great fish rising in pursuit of some night fly, and by the lapping of the water against the wooden sides of the canoe. Before us, luminous and unearthly in the perfect moonlight, shone the walls and the temples of the mysterious city which we had traveled so far to reach. 
we watched them growing more and more distant minute by minute and as we watched strange hopes and fears took possession of our hopes this was no dream before us lay the fabled golden town we so longed to see soon our feet would pass its white walls and our eyes behold its ancient civilization what waits us there whispered the seigneur looking at maya she heard his words and shook her head sadly there was no hope in her eyes which were dimmed with tears then he turned to me as though for comfort the easy fires of enthusiasm burnt up within me and i answered fear not the goal is won and we shall overcome all difficulty and danger the useless wealth of yonder golden city will be ours by its help i shall rake the stored-up vengeance of ages upon the oppressors of my race and create a great indian dominion stretching from sea to sea whereof this city shall be the heart he heard and smiled answering it may be so for your sake i i trust that it will be so but we seek different ends ignatio and he looked again at the lady maya on we glided through the moonlight and the silence for from the town came no sound save the cry of the watchmen calling the hours as they kept their guard along the ancient walls at length we entered the shadow of the holy city lying dark upon the waters and the indians getting out their paddles for the wind no longer served us rode the canoe up a stone embanked canal that led to a water gate we halted in front of the gate where there was no man to be seen in an impatient voice zibalbe bade the captain hail the guardian of the gate and presently a man came down the steps yawning in it and inquired who was there i the catchy k said zibalbe open indeed that is strange answered the man seeing that this night the cacique holds his marriage feast at the palace yonder and there is but one cacique of the people of the heart get back to the mainland wanderers and return in the daytime when the gates stand wide when zibalbe heard these words he cursed aloud in his anger but maya started as though with joy i tell you that i am zibalbe come home again your lord and no other he cried and you will be wise to do my bidding the man stared and hesitated till the captain of the boat spoke to him saying fool would you become food for fishes this is the lord zibalbe returned from the dead then he hastened to open the gate as fast as his fear would let him pardon father pardon he cried prostrating himself but the lord tikal who rules in your place has given it out that you were dead in the wilderness and commanded that your name should be spoken no more in the city zibalbe swept by him without a word when he had passed up the marble steps and through the waterway pierced in the thickness of the frowning walls he halted and addressing the captain of the boatmen said let this man be scourged to-morrow at noon in the market-place that thenceforth he may learn not to sleep at his post on the further side of the wall ran a wide street bordered by splendid houses built of white stone which led to the central square of the city a mile or more away up this street we walked swiftly and in silence and as we went i noticed that much of it was grass-grown and that many of the great houses seemed to be deserted indeed though light came from some of the latticed window places i could see no sign of any human being here is the city whispered the seigneur to me but where are the people uh, doubtless they celebrate the wedding feast in the great square i answered hark i hear them 
As I spoke, the wind turned a little, and a sound of singing floated down it, that grew momentarily clearer as we approached the square. Another five minutes passed, and we were entering it. It was a wide place, covering not less than thirty acres of ground, and in its center, rising three hundred feet into the air, gleamed the pyramid of the Temple of the Heart, crowned by the star of holy fire that flickered eternally upon its summit. In the open space between the walls of the enclosure of this pyramid and the great buildings that formed the sides of the square, the inhabitants of the city were gathered for their midnight feast. All were dressed in white robes, while many wore glittering feather capes upon their shoulders, and were crowned with wreaths of flowers. Some of them were dancing, some of them were singing, while others watched the tricks of jugglers and buffoons. But the most of their number were seated round little tables, eating, drinking, smoking, and making love. We noticed that at those tables the children seemed the most honorable guests, and that everybody petted them and waited on their words. Nothing could be more beautiful or stranger to our eyes than this innocent festival celebrated by the moon. Yet the sight of it did not please Zibalbay. Along the side of the square ran an avenue of trees bearing white flowers with a heavy scent, and Zibalbay motioned to us to follow him into their shadows. Many of the tables were placed just beyond the spread of these trees, so that he was able to stop from time to time, and unseen himself, to listen to the talk that was passing at them. Presently he halted, thus opposite to a table at which sat a man of middle age and a woman young and pretty. What they said interested him, and we who were close by his side understood it, for the difference between the dialect of these people and, and the Maya tongue is so small that even the Senor had little difficulty in following their talk. "'The feast is merry to-night,' said the man. "'Yes, husband,' answered his companion, "'and so it should be, seeing that yesterday the Lord Tikal was elected Kachike by the Council of the Heart, and to-day he was wedded in the presence of the people to Nahua, the beautiful child of the Lord Matahi. And it was a fine sight, said the man, though for my part I think it early to proclaim him Kachike. Zibalbe might yet come back, and then, oh, Zibalbe will never come back, husband, or the Lady Maya either. They have perished in the wilderness long ago. For her I am sorry, because she was so lovely and different from the other great ladies. But I do not grieve much for him, for he was a hard taskmaster to us common people. Also he was stingy. Why, Tikal has given more feasts during the last ten months than Zibalbe gave in as many years. Moreover, he has relaxed the laws, so that we poor women may now wear ornaments like our betters, and she glanced at a gold bracelet upon her wrist. "'It is easy to be generous with the goods of others,' answered the man. "'Zibalbe was the bee who stored. Tikal is the wasp who eats. They say that the old fellow was mad, but I do not believe it. I think that he was a greater man than the rest of us. That is all who saw the wasting of the people, and desired to find a means to stop it. Oh, certainly he was mad, answered the woman. How could he stop the wasting of the people by taking his daughter to wander in the wilderness till they died of starvation, both of them? If anybody dwells out yonder, it is a folk of white devils of whom we have heard, who kill and enslave the Indians, that they may rob them of their wealth. And we do not desire that such should be shown the way to our city. Also, what does it matter to us if the people do waste away? We have all things that we wish. Those who come after must see to it. Yet, wife, I have heard you say that you desired children. Suddenly the woman's face grew sad. Ah, she answered, 
If Zibalbay will give me a child, I will take back all my words about him and proclaim him the wisest of men instead of what he is, or rather was, an old fool gone crazy with vanity and too much praying. But he is dead, and if he were not, he could never do this. That is beyond the power of the gods themselves, if indeed the gods are anything except a dream. So what is the use of talking about him? Let us enjoy the feast that Tikal gives us, husband. And do not speak of children, lest I should weep, and learn to hate those of my sisters who have been blessed with them. Then at a sign from Zabalbe we moved on, but Maya, hanging back for a moment, whispered, Look at my father's face. Never have I seen him so angry, yet these tidings are not altogether ill. And she glanced at the Signor. Now Zabalbe walked on swiftly, pulling at his beard and muttering to himself, till we came to the great archway where two soldiers armed with copper spears stood on guard, chatting with women in the crowd that gathered round the open door, and eating sweetmeats which they offered them. Zabalbe covered his face with the corner of his robe, and, bidding us to do likewise, began to walk through the archway, whereupon the two soldiers, crossing their spears, demanded his name and title. "'By whose orders do you ask?' said Zibalbe. "'By order of our lord the Kachike, who celebrates his marriage feast with the nobles, his guests,' answered one of them. "'Say, are you of their number who come so late?' Then, then Zibalbe uncovered his face and said, "'Look upon me, man. "'Did I command you to shut my own doors against me?' He looked and gasped. "'It is the Kachike. Come home again. "'How then do you say that you keep the doors by order of the Kachike?' "'Can there be two Kachikes in the city of the heart?' asked Sibalbe, in a bitter voice. Without waiting for an answer, he walked on, followed by the three of us, into the plaza, or courtyard of the palace, where many fountains splashed upon the marble pavement. Passing beneath a colonnade and through an open door, doorway, whence light flowed of a sudden, we found ourselves in a great wonderful chamber, a hundred feet or more in length, having a roof of panelled cedar supported by a double row of wooden columns exquisitely carved, between which were set tables laden with fruit and flowers, drinking vessels, and other ornaments of gold. The walls also were cedar-panelled, and hung over with tapestries worked in silver, and ranged along them stood grotesque images of dwarfs and monkeys, fashioned in solid gold, each of which held in its hand a silver lamp. At the far end of this place was a small table, and behind it, seated upon throne-like chairs, were a man and a woman, having an armed guard on either side of them. The man was magnificently dressed in a white robe, broidered with the symbol of the heart and a glittering feathered cloak. Upon his brow was a circlet of gold from which rose a panache or plume of green feathers, and in his hand he held a little golden scepter tipped with an emerald. He was of middle height, very stoutly built, and about five and thirty years of age having straight black hair that hung down upon his shoulders in face he was handsome but forbidding for his dark eyes shone with a strange fire beneath the beetling brows and his powerful mouth and chin were a sullen look that did not leave them even when he smiled the lady at his side was also beautifully attired in white bridal robes bordered with silver, and having the royal heart worked upon her breast, while on her brow, arms, and bosom shone strings of emeralds. She was young and tall, with splendid eyes, and a proud, handsome face, somewhat marred, however, by the heaviness of the mouth, and it was easy to see that she loved the husband at her side, 
for all her looks were towards him. Between us and this royal pair stretched the length of the great hall filled with people, for the most part of the feasters had left their seats so splendidly attired and so bright with the flash of gems and gold that for a few moments our eyes were dazzled. The company, who may have numbered two or three hundred, stood in groups with their backs toward us, leaving a clear space at the far end of the chamber, where beautiful women in filmy silken robes, adorned with flowers and turquoises, were singing and dancing to the sound of pipes before the bride and bridegroom on the throne. End of chapter 14《Heart of the World by H. Ryder Haggard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15 How Zibalbe Came Home. For a while we stood unnoticed in the shadow of the doorway, observing this strange and beautiful scene, till, as Zibalbe was about to advance toward the throne, the Lord Tikal held up his scepter as a signal, and suddenly the women ceased from their dance and song. At the sight of the uplifted scepter, Zibalbe halted again and drew back further into the shadow, motioning us to do likewise. Then Tikal began to speak in a rich, deep voice that filled the hall. "'Counselors and nobles of the heart,' he said, "'and you, high-born ladies, wives, and daughters of the nobles, hear me. "'But yesterday, as you know, I took myself the place and power of my forefathers, "'and by your wish and will I was proclaimed the sole chief and ruler of the people of the heart.' Now I have bidden you to my marriage feast, that you may grace my nuptials and share my joy, for be it known to you that tonight I have taken in marriage Nahua, the beautiful daughter of the High Lord Matai, chief of the astronomers, keeper of the sanctuary, and president of the Council of the Heart. Her, in the presence of you all, I name as my first and lawful wife, the sharer of my power, and your ruler under me, who, whate'er betide, cannot be put away from my bed and throne, and as such I call upon you to salute her. Then, ceasing from his address, he turned and kissed the woman at his side, saying, Hail to you, Lady of the Heart! whom it has pleased the gods to lift up and bless. May children be given to you, and with them happiness and power for many years. Thereon the great company bowed themselves before Nahua, his fair face flushed with pride and joy, and repeated as with one voice, Hail to you, Lady of the Heart, whom it has pleased the gods to lift up and bless. May children be given to you, and with them happiness and power for many years. Nobles, went on Tikal, when the ceremony was finished. It has come to my ears that there are some who murmur against me, saying that I have no right to the ancient scepter of Kachike, which I hold in my hand this night. Nobles, I have somewhat to say to you of this matter, that tomorrow, after the sacrifice, I shall repeat in the ears of the common people, and I say it having consulted with my council, the masters of the mysteries of the heart. Tomorrow a year will have gone by since Zibalbe, my uncle, who was Kachike before me, and his only child and heiress of his rank and power, the Lady Maya, my affianced bride, left the city upon a certain mission. Before they departed on this mission, it was agreed between Zibalbe, Maya, the Lady of the Heart, and myself, and the council, 
the brotherhood of the heart, that I should rule as next heir during the absence of Zibalbay and his daughter, and that if they should not return within two years, that their heritage should be mine for ever. To this agreement I set my name with sorrow for them, as now I held that my uncle was mad, and in his madness went to doom, taking with him his daughter whom I loved. Yet when they were gone, I fulfilled it to the letter. But trouble arose among the people, for they will not listen to the voice of one who is not their anointed lord, but say, We will wait till Zibalbe comes again, and hear his command upon these matters. Also, Zibalbe being absent, there is no high priest left in the land so that until a successor was raised up to him certain of the inmost mysteries of our worship must go uncelebrated thus bringing down upon us the anger of the nameless god so it came about that many pressed it on me that for the sake of the people and the welfare of the city i should shorten the period of my regency and suffer myself to be anointed. But remembering my promise, I answered them sharply, saying that I would not depart from it by a hair's breadth, and that, come what might, two full years must be completed before I sat me down in the place of my father's. To this mind, then, I held till three days since, when those of the people to whose lot it fell, in turn, to pass to the mainland there to cultivate the fields that are apportioned to the services of the temple refused to get them to their labor declaring that the high priest alone had authority over them and there was no high priest in the city then in my perplexity i took counsel with the lord matai master of the stars and he consulted the stars on my behalf all night long he searched the heavens, and he read in them that Zabalbe, who led by a lying dream, broke through the laws of the land, and wandered across the mountains, has paid the price of his folly, and is dead in the wilderness, together with his daughter, that was my affianced, and the lady of the heart. Is it not so, Matai? now the person addressed a stout man with a bald head quick shifting eyes and a thick and grizzled beard stepped forward and said bowing if my wisdom is not at fault such was the message of the stars o lord nobles went on to call you have heard my testimony and the testimony of matai whose voice is the voice of truth for these reasons I have suffered myself to be anointed and set over you as your ruler, seeing that I am the heir of Zibalbe by law and by descent. For these reasons also, she to whom I was affianced, being dead, I have taken to wife Nahu, the daughter of Matai. Say, do you accept us? Some few of the company were silent, but the rest cried, we accept you to call a Nawa, and long may you rule over us according to the ancient customs of the land. It is well, my brethren, answered to call. Now before we drink the parting cup, have any of you aught to say to me? I have something to say to you cried Zibalbe in a loud voice from the shadows wherein we stood at the far end of the hall. At the sound of his voice, the tones of which he seemed to know, Tikal started and rose in fear, but recovering himself said, Advance from the shadows, whoever you are, and say your say where men may see you. Turning to his daughter and to us, Zibalbe bade us follow him, and do as he did. Then, veiling his face with a corner of his robe, he walked up the hall, 
the crowd of nobles and ladies opening a path till we stood before the throne here he uncovered himself as we did also and standing sideways so that he could be seen both by tikal and all that company he opened his lips to speak before a word could pass them a cry of astonishment broke from the nobles and of a sudden the sceptre fell from the hand of tikal and rolled along the floor Zibalbe, said the cry it is Zibalbe come back or the ghost of him and with him the lady of the heart ay nobles he said in a quiet voice although his hand shook with rage it is i Zibalbe, your lord come home and not too soon as it would seem what my nephew were you so hungry for my place and power that you must break the oath you swore upon the heart and seize them before the appointed time and you matai have you lost your skill or have the gods smitten you with a curse that you you prophesize falsely saying that it was written in the stars that we who are alive were dead thereby lifting up your daughter to the seat of the lady of the heart nay do not answer me standing yonder i have heard all your story i say to you to call that you are a forsworn traitor and that you matai that you are a charlatan and a liar who have dared to use the holy art for your own ends and the advancement of your house on both of you will i be avenged ay and on all those who have abetted you in your crimes guards seize that man and the lord hatai with him and let them be held fast till i shall judge them now the soldiers that stood on either side of the thrones hesitated for a moment and then advanced toward tikal as though to lay hands upon him in obedience to zibalbay's orders but nahua rose and waved them off saying what dare you to touch your anointed lord back i say to you if you would save yourselves from the doom of sacrilege living or dead the day of zibalbay is done for the council of the heart has set his crown upon the brow of tikal and whether for good or ill their decree cannot be changed ay said tikal whose courage had come back to him the lady nawa speaks truth touch me not if you would live to look upon this sun but all the while he spoke his eyes were fixed upon maya whose beautiful face he watched as though it were that of some lost love risen from the dead now as the balbe was about to speak again matai the astronomer bowed before him and said be not angry but hear me my lord you have travelled far and you are weary and a weary man is apt at wrath you think that you have been wronged and doubtless all this that has chanced to chanced is strange to you but now is not the time for us to give count of our acts and stewardship or for you uh, to hearken rest this night and to-morrow on the pyramid in the presence of the people all things shall be made clear to you and justice be done to all welcome you zibalbe and to you also daughter of the heart and say who are these strangers that you bring with you from the desert lands across the mountains zibalbe paused a while looking round him out of the corners of his eyes like a wolf in a trap for he sought to discover the temper of the nobles then finding that there were but a few present whom he could trust to help him he lifted his head and answered you are right matai i am weary for age travel and the faithlessness of men have sw have worn me out to-morrow these matters shall be dealt with in the presence of the people 
and there before the altar it shall be made known whether I am their lord or you, Tikal. There, too, I will tell you who these strangers are and why I have brought them across the mountains. Until then I leave them in your charge, for your own sake, charging you to keep them well. Nay, here I will neither eat nor drink. Do you come with me? And he called to certain lords by name, whom he knew to be faithful to him. Then, without more words, he turned and left the hall, followed by a number of nobles. "'It seems that my father has forgotten me,' said Maya, with a laugh, when he had gone. "'Greeting to you all, friends, and to you, my cousin Tikal, and greeting also to your wife, Nahua, who, once my waiting lady, by the gift of fortune, has now been lifted up to take my place in title. Whatever may be the issue of these broils, may you be happy in each other's love, Tikal and Nawa. Now Tikal descended from the throne and bowed before her, saying, I swear to you, Maya. No, do not swear, she broke in but give me and my friends here a cup of wine and some fragments from your wedding feast, for we are hungry. I thank you. How beautiful is that bride's robe which Nawa wears, and surely those emeralds were once my own. Well, let her take them from me as a wedding gift. Make room, I pray you, to call, and suffer these ladies to tell me of their tidings, for remember that I have wandered far, and it is pleasant to see faces that are dear to me. For a while we sat and ate, or made pretense to eat, while Maya talked thus lightly, and all that company watched us, for we were wonderful in their eyes, who never till now had seen a white man. Indeed, the sight of the Signor auburn-haired, long-bearded, and white-skinned was so marvellous to them, that, unlike the common people, they forgot their courtesy, and crowded round him in their amazement. Still there were two who took small note of the Signor, or of me, and these were Tikal, who gazed at Maya as he stood behind her chair, serving her like some waiting slave, and Nawa, his wife, who sat silent, and neglected on her throne, sullenly noting his every word and gesture. At length she could bear this play no longer, but rising from her seat, began to move down the chamber. Uh, "'Make room for the bride, ladies,' said Maya. "'Cousin, good night. It grows late, and your wife awaits you.' Then muttering, I know not what to call, turned and went and side by side the pair walked down the great hall, followed by their guard of soldiers. "'How beautiful is the bride, and how brave the groom,' said Maya, as she watched them go. "'As yet I have seen couples that looked happier on their wedding day. "'Well, it is time to rest. Friends, good night. "'Matai, I leave these strangers in your keeping.' Guard them well, and stay, bring them to my apartments to-morrow after they have eaten, for it is my father's will I would show them something of the city before the hour of noon, when we meet upon the temple-top. When she had gone, Matai bowed to us with much ceremony, and begged us to follow him, which we did, across the courtyard and through many passages, to a beautiful chamber dimly lighted with silver lamps, that had been made ready for us. Here were beds covered with silken wrappings, and on the table in the center of the room cool drinks and many sorts of fruits, but so tired were we that we took little note of these things. Bidding good night to Matai, who looked at us curiously and announced that he would visit us early in the morning, we made fast the copper bolts upon the door and threw ourselves upon the beds. Weary as I was, I could not sleep in this strange place, and when from time to time my eyes closed, the sound of feet passing without our chamber door roused me again to wakefulness. 
Of one thing I was sure, that Zabalbay was not wanted here in his own city, and that there would be trouble on the morrow when he told his tale to the people, for certainly Tikal would not suffer himself easily to be thrust from the place he had usurped, and he had many friends. Doubtless it was their feet that I heard outside the door as they hurried to and fro from the chamber where Matai sat taking counsel with them. What would be our fate, I wondered, in this struggle for power that must come? These people feared strangers so much I could read in their faces, and doubtless they would be rid of us if they might. Well, we had a good friend in Maya, and the rest we must leave to Providence. Thinking thus, at length I fell asleep, to be awakened by the voice of the Signor, who was sitting upon the edge of his bed, singing a song and looking round the chamber, for now the daylight streamed through the lattices. I wished him good morrow, and asked him why he sang. "'Because of the lightness of my heart,' he answered. "'We have reached the city at last.' and it is far more splendid and wonderful than anything I dreamed of. Also the luck is with us, for this Tikal has taken another woman in marriage, who, to judge from the look of her, will not readily let him go, and therefore Maya has no more to fear from him. Thirdly, there is enough treasure in this town, if what we saw last night may be taken as a sample, to enable you to establish three Indian empires, if you wish, and doubtless Zebalbe will give you as much of it as you want. Therefore, friend Ignatio, you should sing as I do, instead of looking as gloomy as though you saw your own coffin being brought in at the door. I shook my head and answered, I fear you speak lightly. There is trouble brewing in this city, and we shall be drawn into it, for the struggle between Tikal and Zibalbe will be to the death. As for the Lady Maya, of this I am certain, that wife or no wife, Tikal still loves her and will strive to take her. I saw it in his eyes last night. Lastly, it is true enough that here there is boundless wealth, but whether its owners will suffer me to have any portion of it to forward my great purposes, useless though it be to them, is another matter. There was a man in the Bible called Job, and he had a friend named Eliphas. I think you are that friend come to life again, Ignatio, answered the Signor, laughing. For my part, I mean to make the best of this present, and not to trouble myself about the future or the politics of this benighted people. But hark, there is someone knocking at the door. I rose and undid the bolt, whereon attendants entered bearing goblets of chocolate and little cakes upon a tray. After we had eaten, they led us to the baths, which were of marble and very beautiful, one of them being filled with water from a warm spring, and then to a chamber where breakfast was made ready for us. While we sat at table, Matai came to us, and I saw that he had not slept that night, for his eyes were heavy. "'I trust that you have rested well, strangers,' he said courteously. "'Yes, Lord,' I answered. "'Well, it is more than I have done.' <laughs> for it is my business to watch the stars, especially my own star, which just now is somewhat obscured. And he smiled. Uh, if you have finished your meal, my commands are to lead you to the apartments of the Lady Maya, who wishes to show you something of our city, which, being strangers, may interest you. But by the way, if I do not ask too much, perhaps you will tell me to what race you belong and he bowed to the Signor. We have heard of white men here, though we have learned no good of them, and tradition tells us that our first ruler, uh, Kukumats, uh, was of this race. Are you of his blood, stranger? I do not know, answered the Signor, laughing. I come from a cold country, far beyond the sea, where all the men are as I am. 
then the inhabitants of this country must be uh, goodly to behold answered matai gravely i thank you for your courtesy son of the sea in answering my question so readily i did not ask it from curiosity alone since the people in this city are terrified of strangers and clamour for some account of you uh, doubtless our friend zibalbay will satisfy them i said uh, good uh, now be pleased to follow me matai led us across courts and through passages till we reached a little ante-room filled with ancient carvings and decorated with flowers where some girls stood chatting tell the lady maya that her guests await her said matai then he turned to take his departure adding in a low voice uh, doubtless we shall meet at noon upon the pyramid and uh, there you will see i know not what whatever befalls be sure of this strangers uh, that i will protect you if i can farewell one of the girls vanished through a doorway at the further end of the chamber and having offered us seats the others stood together at a little distance watching us out of the corners of their eyes presently the door opened and through it came maya wearing a silken serape that covered her head and shoulders and looking very sweet and beautiful in the shaded light of the room greeting friends she said as we bowed before her i have my father's leave to show you something of the city that you long so much to see these ladies here will accompany us and a guard but we shall want no litters until we have ascended the great temple for i desire that you should see the view from thence before the place is cumbered with the multitude come if you are ready accordingly we set out maya walking between us while the guards and the ladies followed after crossing the square which had been the scene of the festival of the previous night but now in the early morning was almost deserted we came to the enclosure of the courtyard of the pyramid a limestone wall worked with sculptures of hunting scenes relieved by a border of writhing snakes and at intervals by emblems of the heart at the gateway of this wall we paused to contemplate the mighty mass of the pyramid that toward us towered over us there is one in the land of egypt that is bigger so said the seigneur although he believed this to be a more wonderful sight because of its glittering slopes of limestone whose expanse was broken only by a vast stair that ran up its eastern face from base to summit it is a great building said maya noting our astonishment and one that could not be reared in these days tradition says that five and twenty thousand men worked on it for fifty years twenty thousand of them cutting and carrying the stone and five thousand laying the blocks where did the material come from then asked the seigneur some of it was hewn from beneath the base of the temple itself she answered but the most was born in big canoes from quarries on the mainland for these quarries can still be seen is the pyramid hollow then i asked yes uh, in it are many chambers for the most part store and treasure houses and beneath its base lies crypts the burying place of the cachuques their wives and children there is also the holy sanctuary of the heart which you being of the brotherhood may perhaps be permitted to visit come let us climb the stair then she led us across the courtyard to the foot of the stairway forty feet mo in, or more in breadth which ran to the platform of the pyramid in six flights each of fifty steps and linked together by resting places up these flights we toiled slowly followed by the ladies and the guard till at length our labour was rewarded and we stood upon the dizzy edge of the pyramid before us was a platform bordered by a low wall large enough to give standing room to several thousand people 
On the western side of this platform stood a small marble house, used as a place to store fuel and as a watchtower by the priests, who were on duty day and night tending the sacred fire which flared in a brazier from its roof. Situated at some distance from this house, and immediately in front of it, was a small altar, wreathed with flowers, but for the rest of the area was empty. Look, said Maya, the city beneath us was built upon a low, heart-shaped island, so hollow in its center that once it might have been the crater of some volcano, or perhaps a mere ridge of land enclosing a lagoon. This island measured about ten miles in length by six across at its widest, and seemed to float like a huge green leaf upon the lake, the holy water of these Indians, of which the circumference is so great that even from the summit of the pyramid a few small and rocky islets excepted land was only visible to the north whence we had sailed on the previous night elsewhere the eye met nothing but blue expanses of uh, inland sea limitless and desolate unrelieved by any sail or sign of life amidst these waters the island gleamed like an emerald here were gardens filled with gorgeous flowers and clumps of beautiful palms and willows framed by banks of dense green reeds that grew in the shallows around the shores so luxuriant was the vegetation fertilized year by year with the rich mud of the lake and so lovely were the trees and flowers in the soft light of the morning that the place seemed like a paradise rather than a home of men and as was the island so was the city that was built thereon following the lines of the land upon which it stood it was heart-shaped a heart of cold white marble lying within the glowing green all about it ran a moat filled with water from the lake on the hither side of this moat stood a wall fifty feet or more in height built of great blocks of white limestone that formed the bedrock of the island which wall was everywhere sculptured with allegorical devices and designs and the gigantic figures of gods wherein the oblong of this wall lay the city a city of palaces pyramids and temples or rather the remains of it for we could see at a glance that the population was unable to keep so many streets and edifices in repair. Thus palm trees were to be found growing through the flat roofs of houses and in crevices of the temple pyramids, while many of the streets and avenues were green with grass and ferns, a narrow pathway in the center of them showing how few were the feet of the passers-by. Even in the great square beneath us the signs of traffic were rare, and there was little of the bustle of a people engaged in the business of life, although this very place had been the scene of last night's feast, and would again soon be filled with men and women flocking to the pyramid. Now and again some graceful, languid girl, a, a reed basket in her hand, might be seen visiting the booths where rations of fish from the lake or of meat fruit dried venison and cocoa were distributed according to the wants of each family or perhaps a party of men on their way to labor in the gardens stopped to smoke and talk together in a fashion that showed time to be of little value to them here and there also a few, a very few, children played together with flowers for toys. In the shadow of the palaces, barracks, and stone houses which bordered the central square, but this was all. For the rest the place seemed empty and asleep. End of chapter 15 
Heart of the World by H. Ryder Haggard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 16 On the Pyramid. "'Does not the city lie very low?' I asked Maya, when we had studied the prospect on every side. "'To my eye, its houses seem almost upon a level with the waters of the lake.' "'I believe that is so,' she answered. "'Moreover, during those months of the year that are coming, the surface of the lake rises many feet, so that the greater part of the island is submerged, and the water stands about the wall.' "'How, then, do you prevent the town from being flooded?' asked the Signor. "'If once the water flowed in the place, would vanish and every soul be drowned?' "'Yes, friend, but the waters never rise beyond a certain height, "'and they are kept from flooding the city by the great sluice-gate. "'If that gate were to be opened in the time of inundation, "'then we should perish every one.' But it never is open during those months, for if any would leave or enter the city, they do so by means of ladders, uh, leading from the summit of the wall to floating landing stages on the moat beneath. Also, night and day the gate is guarded. Moreover, it can be moved from one place only by those that know its secret, who are few. "'It seems a strange place to build a city,' answered the Signor. "'I do not think that I should ever sleep sound during the months of inundation, "'knowing that my life depended upon a single gate. "'Yet men have slept safely here for a thousand years or more,' she said. "'Legends tell us that our ancestors, who came up from the coast in ancient days, "'settled on the island by command of their gods.' "'choosing this hollow bed of land to build in, "'so that rather than submit themselves to foes, "'as their fathers were forced to do, "'in the country beyond the mountains, "'they could, if need were, "'flood the place and perish in the water. "'For this reason it is that the holy sanctuary "'of the nameless God, the heart of heaven, "'is hollowed deep in the rock beneath us, "'for the waters of the lake would flow in upon it at a touch, uh, burying it and all its treasures from the sight of man for ever. Now, if you have seen enough, I will take you to visit the public workshops, where fish is dried, linen woven, and all other industries carried on that are necessary to our comfort. And turning, she led the way with her ladies toward the head of the stairs. As we drew near to it, however, three men appeared upon the platform, in one of whom I knew to call, seeing Maya, he advanced toward her, bowing as he came. Lady, he said, learning that you were here with these strangers, I have followed you to beg that you will speak with me alone for some few minutes. That I cannot do, cousin, she answered coldly. "'for who knows what colour might afterwards be put upon my words. "'If you have anything to say to me, say it before us all.' "'That I cannot do,' he replied, "'for what I have to say is secret. "'Still for your father's sake, and perhaps for your own, "'you will do well to hear it. "'Without a witness I will not listen to you to call. "'Then, lady, farewell,' he said, and turned to go. "'Stay, cousin. "'If you fear to speak before your own people, "'let this stranger,' she pointed to me, Ignatio, "'be present at our talk. "'He is of our blood and can understand our tongue, "'a discreet man, moreover, "'one of the brethren of the heart.' "'One of the brethren of the heart? "'How can a stranger be a brother of the heart? "'Prove it to me, wanderer.' and drawing me aside he said certain words which i answered giving him the signs do you agree asked maya yes lady since i must though it pleases me little to open my mind before a stranger 
let us step apart and he walked to the centre of the platform followed by maya and myself lady he began my business with you is not easy to tell for many years we were affianced and both you and your father promised that we should wed when you return from this journey surely as things are cousin it is needless to discuss the matter of our betrothal she broke in with sarcasm not altogether needless lady he answered i have much to ask your pardon for yet i make bold to ask it maya you know well that i have loved you and love you dearly and that no other woman has ever been near my heart indeed she said with a laugh <laughs> the, these words sound strange in the mouth of a new-made husband of nawa perhaps lady and yet they are true i am married to nawa but i do not love her though she loves me it is you whom i love and when i saw you yesterday all my heart went out to you so that i almost hated the fair bride at my side why then did you marry her because i must because i believed you dead and your father with you as did every man in the city you and zibalbe being dead as i thought was it wonderful that i should wish to keep the place that many were plotting to take from me this could be done in one way only by the help of matai the most clever and the most powerful man in the city and this was matai's price that his daughter should become the lady of the heart well she loved me she is beautiful and she has her father's strength and foresight so that among all the ladies in the land there was none more fitted to be my wife well and you married her and there's an end you ask my forgiveness and you have it seeing that it does not uh, befit me to play the part of a jealous woman doubtless time will soften the blow to me tikal she added mockingly there is not an end maya and i come to ask you today to renew your promise that you will be my wife what cousin having broken your troth would you now offer me insult do you then propose that i the daughter of the heart should be nahua's handmaid no i propose that when nahua is put away you should take her place and your own how can this be seeing that the lady of the heart cannot be divorced if she ceases to be the lady of the heart she can be divorced like any other woman at the least love has no laws and i will find a way the way of death perhaps no i will have none of you honor has laws to cow if love has none go back to your wife and pray that she may never learn how you would have treated her is that your last word lady why do you ask because more hangs on it than you know listen very soon all the men in the city will be gathered on this place to hear your father's words and to decide whether he or i shall rule see already they assemble in the temple square promise to be my wife and in return i will yield to your father and he shall be master for his life's days and have his way in all things refuse and i will cling to power and matters may go badly for him for you and uh, he added threateningly for these strangers your friends all this must befall as it chances she answered proudly i do not meddle with such questions nor do your threats move me if you are so base as to plot mischief against an old man who has poured benefits upon you plot on and in due time meet with your reward for myself i tell you that i have done with you and that come what may i will never be your wife 
"'Perhaps you may yet live to take back those words, lady,' he said in a quiet voice. Then, with a low obeisance, he turned and went. "'You have made a dangerous enemy, lady,' I said, when he was out of earshot. "'I do not fear him, Ignacio.' "'That is well,' I answered. "'But for my part I do.' I think that he plan that his plans are ready, and that before this day is done there will be trouble. Indeed, I shall be thankful if we live to see tomorrow's light. By this time we had reached the others. Are you weary of waiting? she said to the Signor, giving him a sweet look as she spoke. Well, I should have been happier here than I was yonder. Give me your hand and lead me down the stair for i am tired ah friend did you but know it i have just dared more for your sake than i should have done for my own what have you dared he asked that you will learn in due time if we live long enough friend she answered but oh i would that we had never set foot in within this city Two hours had passed, and following in the train of Zibalbe and Maya, who walked beside him once more, we found ourselves upon the summit of the pyramid. Now, however, it was no longer empty, for on it were collected men to the number of some thousands. Indeed, all the adult male population of the city on one side of the altar were seated Tikal and his bride, Naua, who was the only woman there, and some hundreds of nobles, all of whom I noted were armed and guarded by a body of soldiers that stood behind them. On the other side were many vacant places, and as Zibalbe with Maya and all the great company of followers that he had gathered advanced to take them, Tikal and every man present on the pyramid uncovered their heads and bowed in greeting to him after a few moments pause two priests came forward from the watch house behind the altar and having laid upon it an offering of fresh flowers the elder of them who was robed in pure white uttered a short prayer to the nameless god the heart of heaven asking that he would be pleased to accept the gift and to send a blessing upon the deliberations of his people here assembled. Then Zibalbe rose to address the multitude, and I noted that his fierce face was pale and anxious, and that his hand shook, although his eyes flashed angrily. "'Nobles and people of the City of the Heart,' he began, "'on this day a year ago, I, your hereditary ruler and Kachike, and the high priest of the hev heart of heaven, left this city on a certain mission. This was my mission, to find the severed portion of the sacred symbol that lies in the sanctuary of the temple, the portion that is called day, which has been lost for many an age. You know that our race has fallen upon evil times, and that year by year our numbers dwindle, till at length the end of the people is in sight, seeing that within some few generations they must die out and be forgotten. You know also the ancient prophecy that when once more the two halves of the symbol of the heart, day and night, are laid side by side in their place upon the altar in the sanctuary, then from that hour this people shall grow great again. You know, too, how a voice spoke to me in answer to my prayers, bidding me, Zibalbe, to wander forth from the country of the heart, following the road to the sea, for there I should find that which was lost. Thither then, having won the permission of my council, the Brotherhood of the Heart, I have wandered alone with my daughter, the Lady Maya, suffering much hardship and danger in my journeyings, 
and lo, I have found that which was lost, and brought it back to you, for here it hangs upon the neck of this Ignatio, who has accompanied me from the lands beyond the desert. Now a murmur of astonishment went up from the multitude, and Zimbalbay paused a while. Of this matter, of the finding of the symbol, he continued, I will speak more fully at the proper time, and to those who have a right to hear it, namely to the elected brotherhood of the heart, in the holy sanctuary on the day of the rising of waters being one of the eight days in each year on which it is lawful for the council of the heart to meet in the sanctuary. But first, in this hour, I will deal with other questions. It is known to you that when I went upon my mission, I left my nephew Tikal to sit in my place, it being agreed between us and the council that if I should return no more within two years, he should become Kachike of the people. I have returned within one year, and I find this, that already he has allowed himself to be anointed Kachike, and more, that he, who was affianced to my daughter, has taken another woman to be his wife. Last night with my own ears I heard him proclaim his treachery in the hall of the palace, and when I spoke out, the bitterness that was in my heart, I, your lord, was met with threats, and told that Tikal, having been anointed, could not now be deposed. I use the saying against him, Nobles, I have been anointed, and ruled over you and the people for many years, and can I then be deposed, I, who am not a traitor to my master, nor a forswearer on my oaths, as is my nephew yonder? Again he paused, and some of the audience, with those who had accompanied Zabalbe, shouted, No! But the most of them looked towards Tikal and were silent. Now Matai rose from his place behind Tikal and spoke, saying, as one who had to do with the anointing of Tikal to be Kachike, when we believed you and the Lady Maya to be dead, I would ask you, Zibalbe, before we on this side of the altar answer you, to tell us openly what is the meaning of this journey that you have undertaken, and for what purpose have you brought these two strangers, who are named Ignatio and Son of the Sea, with you in defiance of the ancient law, which says that he who brings a stranger across the mountains into the land of the city of the heart shall die together with the strangers. Now, when Zabalbe heard this question, he started, for he had forgotten this law, and saw the cunning trap that Matai had spread for his feet. Nevertheless, he answered boldly, since it was his nature to be outspoken and straightforward. It becomes you ill, Matai, to question me, you who have proved yourself a plotter and a, a lying prophet, reading in the stars that I and my daughter were dead, while we still draw the breath of life beneath them. Yet I will answer you, and scorning the subterfuge or falsehood set out the whole matter in the hearing of the people, that they may judge between me, uh, your party, and your master. First, I will say that I had forgotten the law of which you speak. Whenceforth I have broken the letter, or, if at any time I remembered it, my necessities caused me to disregard it. Learn, then, that the stranger Ignacio is of royal Indian blood, and the holder of that symbol which I went forth to seek and that the white man whom you call son of the sea is as a brother to him, and that both of them are the fellowship of the heart. 
the Lord Ignatio being no less a man than the master of the order in yonder lands, as I am here. This Lord Ignatio I summoned to me, and he came. He came, and with his companion, son of the sea, saved me and my daughter from shame and death at the hands of certain murderers, white men. Then when we had escaped, we tried each other and laid the symbols side by side, and lo, day and night came together, and they were one. Then also I told him the story of how it happened, that I was wandering far from my own place, and he told me what was his purpose and the desire of his life. This is his purpose, to break the yoke that the white man has set upon the neck of the Indians in the far lands, and to build up a mighty Indian nation stretching from sea to sea, whereof this city, heart of the world, shall be the center and the capital. Then we made a compact together, a compact that cannot be broken, and it was this, that the Lord Ignatio, with the white man, his companion, from whom he will not be separated, should accompany us here, where the symbol should be set in the appointed place, that the prophecy may be fulfilled, and the fortune return to us, that I should give him so much as he may need of the treasures which lie useless in our storehouses, wherewith he may arm troops and bring about his ends, and that in return he should bring to us what we need far more than gold and gems, men and women, with whom we may intermarry so that our race, ceasing to dwindle, may once again multiply and grow great. Such, nobles, is our compact. And this is the path which the God who rules us has pointed out for our feet to tread. Accept it and grow great. Refuse it and perish. For know that no, not for myself do I speak, who am old and near to death, but for you and your prosperity for ever. Be not bewildered or amazed, for... Though these things are new to you, it may well chance that after the Council of the Heart has been celebrated in the sanctuary on the night of the rising waters, the God whom we worship, the nameless God under whose guidance all these things have come about, will reveal his purpose by the mouth of his oracle and show what part these strangers and each of us shall play in the fate that is to be. O oh, nobles and my people, let not your sight be dim nor your heart hardened, and put not away the fortune and the future that lies before you. I have dared much for your sake. Dare a little for your own. Shut your ears and your gates, and rise in rebellion against me, and I tell you that soon there shall remain of you and your glorious home scarcely a memory. Be gentle, and be guided by my wisdom and the will of your gods, and your fame and power shall cover the world. I... You shall be to what you were as in the sun, in all its glory to some faint and fading star. I have spoken. Now choose. He ceased, and for a while there was silence, the silence of a maze, for the nobles stared on each other, and such of the common people as were within earshot, stood gaping at him with open mouths, since to them who did not meddle in matters of policy, and indeed thought little for themselves, his words had small meaning. Presently it was broken, 
Anne by Tikal, who sprang from his seat and cried aloud, Of a truth they were wise who said that this old man was mad. Have you heard and understood, O people of the heart? This is what you must do to fulfill the will of Zebalbe. First you must set him in his place again, giving him all power, and me you must condemn to death or chain.